Hello everyone and welcome to my Floss Tube channel or should I say welcome back to my channel for those of you who are familiar with my videos. Today is Thursday, the sun is shining and I'm sitting down, I'm going to work on Modern Folk Embroidery's um, Fruits of Plenty. This is a design which I started goodness knows when. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it hadn't been a year ago but it probably wasn't far off um, and <laughs> it's a gorgeous design and um, normally I stitch this one in hand as in I sit down and stitch it on a chair without having it on a stand um, but yes I do always have it on a hoop or a frame so I thought I'd do a little bit of this one today because it's a little bit of a diversion from my normal stitch with me's which are usually the full coverage because that's let's face it basically 99% of what I do is full coverage there's not a lot of anything else that I stitch <laughs> and I guess that's just me I'm a full coverage person so I'm going to do some stitching and a little bit of chatting I have no idea what I'm going to talk about so you'll have to excuse me if the whole thing comes out pretty random um, I'm known for my randomness. Uh, hopefully it's not such a bad thing because I don't tend to pre-organise a, a video of what I'm going to say. I tend to just go with the flow, whatever comes into my head. And sometimes I think that's the best way because then you, it doesn't come across like you've got some kind of agenda or a plan of what you're talking about. So for better or for worse... <clears throat> Sorry, I do feel a bit croaky today. I don't know why that is. As soon as I start doing re voice recordings or anything, I, I tend to get all croaky, which is... The frog isn't just um, useful for frogging. The frog tends to also jump down your throat and give you a nasty sort of croak. <laughs> so anyway, how has everybody been? I hope you've all been well. I think it's been a couple of weeks since I last did a video, a stitch with me. And I can't, I don't have a clue what I talked about. I can't remember what I talked about in the <laughs> last video. Um, so I have to apologize if I repeat myself or contradict myself or any of those things. I just can't remember. So we're going to start afresh. Um, <laughs> sometimes I think maybe it's a good idea to actually think about what I'm going to say in advance. <laughs> so let's see. What has been happening in my world? Well, you know, I'm not one for having tons of dramas or anything but um I'm sitting here and I'm really glad that the sun is out today because we have had a couple of weeks of horrendous um well I won't actually horrendous is the wrong word to use because the weather has not been horrendous the weather has just been disappointing it's been a disappointing spring and it's just sort of been drizzly and drab and gray and I think I'm just going to get the weather bit out of the way first so I can get to more interesting stuff. Um, when I watch a lot of YouTube videos, I do tend to hear other people complaining in different parts of the world about the very same issue of the weather being rubbish. So I'm assuming that it's not just the UK or Scotland that are suffering from a poor spring. We're not just we're just not having nice spring weather. So it's just, it's just not inviting. It's not exciting. We don't want to there's no you know um inspiration or motivation to go outside because it's been drizzling and cold and when i say cold i mean i'm actually still wearing cardigans and not thick jumpers maybe just cardigans and things still and it's what may may 11th now and i'm sitting here in a cardigan so yeah it's it's just not it's not great is it but anyway today the sun is out so let's be thankful for that and I'm really happy because I, I do like a bit of sun. I mean, I, I always used to complain about too much sun when I used to live in the Mediterranean. But I can safely say that there is such a thing as too much sun for anybody, uh, whether they admit it or not. And <laughs> I'm one of those people that kind of would prefer, you know, a little bit of a cooler climate than full blown extreme. Let's just burn our face off kind of weather. I really do like um, the more temperate, the more intermediate, intermediate, cool, maybe a little bit warm, sometimes a bit hot, but not like from one extreme to the other. So yeah, today, today I'm in a good place because it's just nice. So that aside, it's put me in a good mood. Um, 
And what have I been working on? Well, let's see. I've been working on my... Do you know, it's funny actually, because I was sort of doing a bit of a rotation between my focus piece, which is Riverwalk Charm. Then I sort of was, I was sort of rotating other ones around it, maybe one or two others, not too many. And I seem to have gone back to just, just at the moment I've been working on Riverwalk Charm in the last while. And I've been working on the new one I started, which is called Butterfly Port something. Um, <laughs> basically butterfly ornament from heaven and earth designs and it's a cute little round uh design and i started that one just not long ago a couple of weeks ago and i brought that one out because that one also i don't need to put on a stand i can sit on my recliner and i can even stitch while i'm reclining isn't that amazing so i like to bring that one out this one the fruits of plenty hasn't had any attention from me since two sundays ago i just wasn't feeling it so i I kind of just pick out the ones I feel and I'm really sort of going, you know, guns blaring with this um, Riverwalk charm. It really is sort of getting me going and I just can't seem to put it down at the moment, can't seem to walk away from it either. So I'm sort of struggling to bring anything in, but that's a good thing, right? That has to be a good thing. The fact that I don't want to keep starting new ones or rotating like a mad person. The fact that I'm just sitting there and I'm still plodding away with the same one is, is a good thing too, because it means I'm getting loads of progress on that particular piece and okay so maybe i'm not getting so much in the others but it is a big piece it's going to take ages to finish anyway so you know being all interested and up for doing that one merely makes it good because it means it'll be done that little bit sooner than than i anticipated so i also think there's an element of not having the right focus i think i haven't had the right focus to be doing the rotating i think i've just kind of been you know running around doing the things that i normally do then slumping down into my chair at the end of the day or if i've got time in the afternoon and then i say oh what's on the, what's on the what's on the stand oh this one is still on the stand well you know what i can't be bothered to take it off the stand and then go and find all the thre the thread box for the other ones might as well just sit down and carry on with it so there is that element of it because it's already there and it's already waiting to be worked on you know just get <laughs> just do what's on the stand so there's been a little element of that going on so it's been up and down sit down stitch up and down sit down stitch and um i think a couple of nights i went to bed and i said oh i'm going to uh just bring out this butterfly one that i started because if I don't, then what, what What? the hell was the point of starting it? So out came the little butterfly. And, you know, everything else, I've no idea. I've just, I've no idea. Ask me again. Ask me again next time. Or <laughs> when I do the, when I do the, uh, the end of month progress parade, which is very likely going to be small, short and sweet with my little parade of one or two. But hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to even apologize for that. So what else? Also, I started knitting a new, um, I, it was supposed to be a throw, but I think it's turning into a blanket. Not because I've done loads, but because I've added so many stitches. It was a baby blanket pattern and I kind of increased the stitches because I wanted it, it to be a throw. But I've not, I'm not very good, you see, at the math. And I start thinking, well, you know, maybe 10 extra stitches is not enough or... 20 extra stitches not enough and this you know this baby blanket looks small in the picture not like you could really tell in a picture looking at the dimensions trying to work it out looking at the size and then I think well you know I'm just going to go up by like 100 stitches or something I think it's turning into a blanket <laughs> or a bedspread I couldn't really tell how long it was going to be because it's all kind of bunched up around my circular needle. You know, when you use, if any knitters out there know how to use circular needles, if you do something very big and um, you don't have a circular needle that's long enough to accommodate all those stitches, they all get bunched up around. Um, it's not a round blanket, by the way, it is a, it's a sort of square rectangular. But I do everything on circular needles. I, I Long gone are the days when I used aluminium needles. Um, so I everything's bunched around. I can't measure what it's going to turn out. So I just carried on knitting, just carried on knitting. And then as it starts to grow, I'm thinking, my goodness, this is actually turning into a bedspread. But hey, I don't mind. You know, I've so what happened then? I was trying to use up this yarn that I have, and.
and uh, and then I was suddenly thinking, my God, I'm not going to have enough now because I've, I've added so many stitches. I have to go out and buy another ball of this yarn, which has totally defeated the purpose of using up the yarn that I had because now I've gone and uh, got onto a bus and gone to Hobbycraft, which is like, I don't, there's not a lot of places to buy yarn here in Edinburgh, to be honest. There's a couple of shops, there's a couple of places, but they're not huge and they're pricey. Um, but I just wanted your, your, you know, your very sort of mediocre acrylic with a little bit of wool in, nothing too expensive, not like these fancy wancy type of, um, I don't know what you call them, are they skeins, are they, got funny names now, they're all sort of twisted, they look like loaves of bread. <laughs> Everything's just getting so posh, isn't it? Everything's just getting so posh. And uh, <laughs> so there I was on the bus going off to get my my 400 grams, like double-sized ball of yarn that I needed to accommodate the yarn that I wanted to use up. <laughs> so I have to make a point now of actually using all of it. No matter how big this thing gets, it could get gigantic now because I now have 800 grams of yarn because I'm the person that says I like to be, you know, cautious about things and to accommodate everything and make sure that I have enough of things. I don't wait till I get to like the last little bit of thread and then say, well, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll be able to finish with this extra little bit. No, I'm not even into my first ball and I'm already buying a second ball because that's me. I have to be, you know, I have to be organized. I have to have everything to hand. And yeah, so there I went. But it was a nice day trip went down and it was nice and sunny some of the time and I went in and I did a lot of walking around and I love going around looking at all the crafts not just the yarn and not just the cross stitch stuff I look at all the crafts and I usually never buy anything except yarn or cross stitch stuff <laughs> um which is probably just as well actually my husband would say good job she doesn't and um oh actually I did come home with uh last time I went I came home with a macrame kit which I still haven't opened I was all excited by the idea of doing that, but it's got some mathematical, um, again, the maths, some mathematical stuff that you have to figure out, and I put it in a bag. And I know that when I put something in a bag, it's probably not going to be seen for a couple of months again, but never mind. I have it there for the day when it, you know, I say, oh, I'm going to do this macrame wall hanging. So between the knitting project and the running around a little bit, and um, and also just having Riverwalk time on my stand ready to go, there hasn't been a lot of rotation. So that's basically the point I wanted to make. And sorry that I went through such a long-winded way to say it. <laughs> so anyway, what, I, what I've heard is a lot of people for Mania have been doing some, um, well, very varied actually. Some of them have been saying that they want to do, to pick like one or two seasonal projects and just work through them. Um, and other people have been saying that they're really interested in just being monogamous and doing the one piece, which is, I'm kind of like semi-monogamous. Is that even a word? Because monogamous is one. So can you have semi, which is uh, maybe two on top of your one? And doing kind of sitting down and doing that, as I said. So yeah, um, it's not been it's not been that difficult, and I I didn't really want to get more pieces out. Because then what happens is I start rotating too frequently, and I feel like I'm not making enough progress on any. I'm making little bits of progress on most of them, but not enough on any. And I think I figured out after three years of stitching that I like to see progress more than I like to see rotations. So it's been such a balancing act and a lot of people who start stitching take so long to figure out what kind of stitcher they are because it's not apparent when you start. You have to go through all the different, you have to go through all the good and the bad really. You have to go through the whole new start, new start and then I want to be monogamous. No, I don't. Yes, I do. And then you get to a point where you say, you know, I know what I like now. This is what I like doing. And then you kind of settle into your own little world. You settle into what it is you like and you just continue like that. But, you know, things can change. We always say this, things can change. We get into different moods, different ideas, different motivation. And um, yeah, sometimes we want, like I haven't picked up my knitting much for ages and I really like my knitting. I also like crochet. 
So I was kind of really happy to get back into it. It was a different way of working, different way of your brain interpreting things and different way of stitching using your hands. So I really enjoyed it and um, I'm feeling a bit nasally here. I wonder if I'm coming down with something. Oh no, she says, I really don't want to come down with anything else. I've had enough of chronic things for a while. <laughs> okay, so that's that. And let's see, what else have I been doing? I've been doing quite a bit of reading because I love reading books, but I'm very bad at sitting reading books because... I tend to start reading a book and then I think, oh, maybe I'll just go and hang out, hang out the laundry or oh, maybe I'll just bookmark this page and go and clean that table over there or, or maybe I'll just pop, pop outside and get some groceries. And it just drives me mad because I end up just having not even read a page in between doing everything else. I just can't seem to focus. So I made myself, made myself sit down for an hour and actually read and I was motivated to do this by my son actually because he's got himself my teenager has got himself into a system where he's got an alarm on his phone and he sits down and he reads for I think it's 10 15 minutes and the alarm goes off when he's done and it just reminds him reading time and he comes out into the front room and he sits down and he just sits there opens his book turns off his alarm reads then the alarm goes off after 15 minutes and then he's done. And he's gone through so many books like that, honestly, because he's just made a habit of it. So I thought, well, if he can do it, why can't I do it? So I should be able to do maybe half an hour even of sitting down and reading. And I think my best time of reading usually when I don't have to get loads of things done is at night. But then I go to bed and when I start the actual reading in bed, I start to fall asleep. And I think that's the problem a lot of people have is that so my brain's kind of associated reading with sleeping so that when I sit on a chair during the day and I start reading I just nod off which is not ideal so I've had to kind of retrain my brain to say no reading time is not sleeping time do not fall asleep it's so easy for you you know to, to, to teach your brain something like that you wouldn't believe it and um, so I've had to start increasing the amount of time that I can read during the day without nodding off Um, because quite simply I'm not even understanding what I'm reading when I start my eyes start drooping and my head starts going down (laughs) I've lost half a chapter so yeah but I have been reading and what have I been reading you're probably wondering well I'm always into history I'm always reading up history books I'm absolutely obsessed with Mary Queen of Scots and I've, I've just read nearly every biography there is out there to do with this queen, the Scottish queen, because she has such an interesting life story. And if you haven't read about her, just go and read her biography or one of her books. She has had the most dramatic life. And it's so interesting. And also reading about Elizabeth I, the Elizabethan queen. Anything to do with the Tudors, I have been fascinated. And uh, when I was down at Holyrood Palace, um where Mary Queen of Scots used to live years and what 500 years ago or something and they had a wonderful exhibition in her outer chamber with these you know tall sort of glass panels with all her sort of artifacts laid out and it was just mesmerizing to see her embroidery now and I was really starting to get interested in her embroidery lately because of the fact that I'm doing cross stitch and um she's she does lo- she did loads of embroideries and tapestries and i was just wondering you know how intricate this was back then and were they using the same kind of threads and were they using the same kind of fabrics and then i read that that they would use you know really top quality um threads and top quality fabrics and everything was just expen- really expensive because it came she ordered her things from france and her supplies used to come and they would have actual designers designing the actual tapestries for them so she would say okay look maybe I want to do a tapestry with my um, symbolic um, emblem and I also want um, I don't know some flowers as a border and I want also to have a dolphin in the middle or an animal or a bird she would tell them what she wanted and they would design it for her and send her the supplies so she could stitch it and apparently she used to use very expensive silks now I've only um stitched with silk one time and I thought it was quite nice to stitch with I thought it was smooth and it was easy although I've heard some people say it's very difficult 
So I, looking inside these these beautiful, you know, at these beautiful artifacts, it was really interesting to see. The, one of the pieces was a little silk purse, which was made with beads, like sort of pearls and little um, sort of silver beads. And it had a little clasp and it looked very much like a little girl's purse that I might even have purchased when I was a little girl about the age of seven or eight, just a tiny little purse. And she would embroider it herself. And I think she would have MR uh, Marie Regina, I guess that is, uh, as, as the Queen's signature. And it's just so interesting, it really was. So that was amazing to see. And I also got a book to, which talked all about her tapestries and everything else. So yeah, that's one of the things that I like to read about. And I, I started trying to get into crime, I think, but I, I, I still haven't found a book that's really good, that's really drawn me in. Um, so any recommendations would be good. I know that there's quite a few videos out there with recommendations I should maybe go and check out because a lot of people do like online, online reviews of books and that's really good and that's really helpful as well. So there's been the, the, the reading that I'm getting into. Um, let's see. And also, I have been into town a few times. And I'm thinking about maybe having a little day trip some point next month. Because I feel like because the weather hasn't been great, I haven't really been getting out as much as I've wanted to. And I've noticed that with myself. That when the weather's not good, I tend to use it as an excuse not to go outside and I think that's that can be terribly damaging for your not only for your confidence but for your um for your mental health and um I think that telling myself that is probably not a good idea and that unless it's absolutely lashing and completely you know awful I just I don't think it's a valid excuse so but now that the better weather's coming in I think I'm probably going to be making more of an effort to get outside um it's kind of difficult for all of us to get outside as a family because fortunately my boys are not really outsidey kind of people. They're very computer, gamey, stay indoors kind of people. And when you have um, people in your family like that, it's very hard to motivate them or inspire them to do anything outside. And it really kind of runs into me getting you know maybe excited one day and saying hey come on let's all go out and we'll all get something to eat and we'll all go for a walk so I've got these grand ideas in my head of having a fantastic day out and then it all ends up in all of us splitting up one annoyed with the other me on the bus husband walking with my son not all of us all, all in a bad mood because it didn't turn out the way we wanted it to so, you know, a lot of the time I just have to go out on my own because, or with a friend, because I feel like if I try to drag them out and do the things I want to do, uh, it doesn't really work. And so I say to them, well, what is it you want to do? And they just kind of stand there looking at me like, do? We don't want to do anything. Like, well, what is there? Why do we need to go outside? You know, <laughs> it's totally ridiculous. I'm sure some of you can sympathize with me on that one, especially when you've got teenage sons. Like he's not into fashion, he's not into anything. And when it comes to spending money, you can just go into, uh, you can buy your games online, right? You can just go into the internet and buy your games, download them. You don't even have to go outside. So more and more, this staying at home business, whether it be for social media, for, for doing your shopping, for doing stuff like I'm doing now, which is actually socializing in a very strange way. And... Um, talking you know as if it was some kind of radio show um it's becoming more and more insular more and more isolated and i think more and more people even though we pertain to be on social media i think a lot of people are becoming very unsociable actually because we're all sort of oh well i can just chat to people on you know through whatsapp or i can chat to people like this through the internet in one way or another and i don't have to to get outside and i don't have to travel or get in my car um, so I'm not saying everybody's like that. There's plenty of people who love traveling and still travel. But it's one of those things that, that is giving us an option to be not lazy, I wouldn't say. It doesn't make us lazy. But it gives us an option to just not bother to do things that we used to have to do because we didn't have any choice. 
Um, if I wanted to talk to my friend when I was 12 years old, I used to, or maybe a bit younger, I used to have to go all the way to the end of the street and knock on her door. And if she wasn't there, I'd have to go home, come back again later. So maybe two or three times a day, at intervening periods, I would go to the end of the street and knock on my door and say, Sharon there? And maybe her parents would say, no, she's not in. She's gone, I don't know where, to hockey or something. Come back later and I go back later, no given time. Is Sharon back? No, she's not back yet. Come back later. So it was constantly... That's what I had to do to get into contact with my friends. Today, I just have to send a text and wait for a reply. It's as simple as that. Um, it actually makes us, you know, it, it's easier to talk to people, but it's also so much colder, so much colder way to, to communicate. Um, And I think what I do actually miss when it comes to talking to people uh, through the internet or on, you know, texting people in general, I actually miss that face-to-face -face, um, talking, the, the expressions, being able to understand how somebody feels just by, you know, a simple glance, just by the tone of their voice. And so many times we get it wrong, right, when we're texting people or people text us, we think they're annoyed and they're not, or we think they're being rude and they're not, but it's just because texting words doesn't have any inflections, it doesn't have any expression, it doesn't have anything attached to humanity, really. It's just a digital thing. And it doesn't comply with, with you know, with what we are and how we express ourselves so often you know it's I mean I think pe we've got better now people have got better with this communicating communicating business that we're able to sort of be able to do it in a way that doesn't offend other people usually if we don't want to be offending them but I find that I I do miss you know when talking through text it's difficult to to read between the words and see what people actually mean sometimes uh, especially new people that you don't really know if you're talking to someone and maybe they say something and that could be taken as an insult or it could be taken as a joke and you think well are they joking or are they actually being mean and there's been many times in the past where I've been you know talking in social groups or whatever and actually just left the chat or whatever because I thought somebody was being offensive or rude maybe they actually weren't but it's so difficult to translate it, you know, especially if you, like we all translate things differently. And then I think later on, maybe that person actually wasn't saying, maybe he was just joking and it was just a bad joke. You know, we can just sometimes say something that we don't actually mean as anything harmful. And I think, well, you know, that it's a shame because that person in real life might have been a good friend. And we all lost that opportunity because I just decided there and then to cut them off. And it's happened the other way around. People have cut me off because they think probably didn't like what I said or the way it was expressed. Um, it's very easy to get the wrong end of the stick. But I think we've got better with that now. And uh, I still don't think that emojis are any kind of substitute for a lovely face that smiles at you or laughs or anything like that. I think it's just a poor kind of substitute, really. But what is nice about being able to talk through the internet is the fact that you can do it with people from all over the world, like I'm talking to you now. And how would we, you know, we we never could ever do that back in the 80s and 90s. We couldn't do that. And it, it was something fantastical or, you know, something we just thought, was sci-fi sci film stuff you know oh my goodness you can talk to people on the other side of the world from your own living room it was just crazy and here we are every day lots of people all over the world talking to each other it has opened doors it's opened doors and it's helped people to understand other cultures better we've become more understanding um and it's made the world bigger for a lot of us which again is good both good and bad it's made the world bigger for many people, people who might have been trapped in their homes for all sorts of reasons, physical and otherwise. And maybe no friendless people have made friends with people on different parts of the globe, but that we're also open to 
all the tragedies and things that happen, which are things that we wouldn't necessarily have heard about or known about had we not had this international access to information. I often think that I can't watch the news because the news is too upsetting. And um, I remember in a period of feeling that I was under a dark cloud. And when I'm under a dark cloud, just about everything that hurts other people also hurts me. And if I watch something or read something about a child or an animal or a vulnerable person or anybody who's vulnerable being hurt or, or treated cruelly in any way, I would just end up in floods of tears. And um, it got to a point where I went to see a doctor and I wanted to explain to him that, you know, I, I, I couldn't cope with the world we were living in because it was just so cruel and horrible and all you ever hear about is is the bad stuff and um well the first doctor I actually went to wasn't very sympathetic he kind of said well you know surely you should see that that kind of stuff is not happening to you or your family so why are you sad you should be grateful for what you have and that you're not suffering like they are and completely wrong approach because I was suffering because they are that was the whole point but I don't think he got it and you know some talk some doctors don't even understand depression they don't even acknowledge it so but the second doctor that I went to was was really helpful and he gave me some uh, good tips and he said you know you got to streamline your news feeds not look at this stuff that's upsetting you because you know life is hard it's hard to deal with stuff but why are you adding things to your plate when they're clearly not working for you like some people can read the news and they just don't have the emotion the, the depth of emotion they scroll through and think oh well you know a normal reaction would be oh that's terrible that's very sad feel a little bit remorse maybe even upset for a while but then they just scroll on and to the next thing whereas I was getting deeply distressed about things which was wasn't really normal and um, yeah I, I, I got a lot better I got a lot tougher emotionally because I think I had to and I was able to streamline all the incoming information that was coming into my head because I thought if I didn't do that I was taking all I was basically like taking the world on my shoulders and feeling too much pity and sympathy for the rest of the world when really there's nothing I can do about 99% of the stuff that goes on in the rest of the world so it just had to be dealt with from the inside and yeah it was a lesson that I learned and I grew I grew to be stronger with that lesson so you don't ever feel guilty for not reading bad stuff don't ever feel guilty for it because you have to look after yourself to be able to look after others because if you can't look after yourself you can't look after other people and it was affecting my my family to the point it was affecting my family because they were sad because I was sad and it just it, it it's not good so yeah I forgot what my first point was now that I was making all this <laughs> all these <laughs> so the other thing I did was I watched some of the king's coronation I know that it wasn't for everybody and I know that there's a lot of people who are really into it and they all drove down to London and to support the the king Charles III coronation and there's a lot of monarchists out there who are really into this kind of thing I really do sit on the fence. I'm not politically minded. Even if I had an opinion, I don't tend to generally share it with people. I I honestly don't know. I kind of enjoyed watching some of it. I thought it was lovely to see um, the royals and the children and all the rest of it. I thought it was nice. But I think it's a really difficult one because there are so many elements to to, to it that can be argued that can be you know brought into debate and it just goes on and on and on and watching videos and you know people talking about how it's such an old-fashioned thing well yeah well that's tradition tradition is old-fashioned you know that's what it is and I can understand people wanting to keep tradition because tradition is something that is steadfast it is security it is something that you can fall back on and say well you know if everything else goes down the toilet at least we've got our traditions if you lose tradition you you're kind of wiping history in a way so i understand people holding on to tradition 
through through their beliefs and um, and it makes them feel important like part of something but I can also understand future generations having a pop because they feel like you know we've come such a long way and we're still working towards um, we're still working towards equality working towards so many things and these old stuffy traditions are just you know kind of hindering everything and getting in the way so I kind of understand their point also so I understand all the points so it's very very difficult to just like you know there's no black or white answer it's very difficult to say you should get rid of the whole monarchy it's very difficult to say no don't get rid of the whole you know it's really really hard because everybody has got an opinion on how a country should be run everybody has got an opinion on leadership and yeah it's that's just the way it is so for me I kind of sit not on either side of the fence but sort of bang in the middle of it and I just like to watch I just like to watch either side <laughs> I moved around a lot since I was very young so I never felt truly patriotic which is one of the things that I've come to understand about myself is that I never actually felt like I belonged anywhere because when you grow up in a place and then you're torn from that place and then you, you, you spend years in another place and then you leave that place and, and so on and so on. I don't know if it happens to other people, but I never truly felt like I, 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 I never truly felt like I was one of the, of the crowd. I never felt like I fitted in anywhere because I was different to everywhere I went. And so I grew up in the UK, and, but I didn't look, particularly look English, so I didn't feel English. And at the time, um, you know, people would bully me in school and everything and call me names because I did look very Mediterranean. However, I did sound very English because I was living in England and that's where I had grown up to about the age of 12. And then we all moved to, uh, to the Mediterranean and I did not sound you know, like a Mediterranean person would sound. I sounded very English, even though my skin was fairly tanned. And so again, I would, did not feel like I fitted in. I could not speak the language. I, it was just, I, I didn't fit in. Um, it was very hard to, so the only place that I could really call home was in my heart. That's the only place that I can call home. And even now, whilst I love my home and I love the new place that I've bought, you know, it, it, I've put my stamp on it and everything else. It it isn't my true home. My true home is my true home is where my my family are, and in my heart, it's not a place. It's not a stone wall. It's not a, a set of furniture. It's nothing that I could lay down in a material object. My true home is the people I love. I think that's what I've come to recognise it as being. Um. So yeah, that's probably why I have such a funny attitude towards uh, anything to do with, you know, patriotic type of discussions or anything like that. And I remember one day when I was doing this kind of, you know, internal kind of uh, analysis and trying to dig a little bit deeper into my thoughts and into my soul. I remember writing down a couple of questions and they were just simple questions that anybody might ask themselves at any point. But I was wanting to look deeper into the answer and I wrote down, who am I and where am I from? And so many times I walked away from that question because I just could not answer it. I just did not know truly in the depths of my soul who I was or where I was from. I could tell you where I was from to be my place of birth, but I never stayed there. I moved to somewhere else and I spent more years in the second place than I did in the original one. And then I moved again and then I moved again. So when people say, where are you from? I can give them chronological facts, but in my heart, I have no idea really. Um, and then the other question, who am I? Well, phew, there's a million and one answers to that question and you still cannot get to the bottom of it. Um, now I tend to look upon myself in a more spiritual way than I ever would have done before because in a physical body you I don't know why but I often feel that if, if I look deeper 
than race and colour of skin and origin and ancestry and all that stuff. If I look deeper, there has to be something more unique. There has to be something there that belongs only to me. It doesn't just belong to, the, you know, my ancestors or the place that I was born in. The place I was born in could have been anywhere. I could have been born anywhere. I didn't get a choice in that matter. Um, so I, I've spent quite a while looking, trying to look deeper into myself when I ask that question, who am I? I often find that the answer is easier when I don't have to explain it in words. It's easier to recognize within myself rather than something that I can articulate because to articulate it gives it a more physical dimension, but to think about it in a more soulful and spiritual way means that I'm, I, I just lose words. I don't need words because I suddenly find who I am just by looking deep inside myself where words are not. And I don't know if other people feel the same, but it's actually quite interesting. And if you ever feel lost as to, you know, where you are or who you are, just look at inwards, look inwards at yourself and try to recognize the person that you are inside, your deepest, deepest feelings, even the dark ones. Just try to, re you know, look internally and I think you get a lot of answers actually that way even if you can't put them into words so oh my goodness that was a very very strange chat <laughs> it all just came tumbling out so I am sorry if none of it appealed to you um, it's really hard to know what to talk about when you talk to so many when you talk to people who are watching you don't know who's watching it's very difficult to to kind of target any particular topic so all I can say is that thank you for listening and staying with me because it allows me also to speak more freely and to feel less inhibited I feel like I'm talking to a friend when I'm talking to you and that actually brings a smile to my face and it actually brings me closer to you um, I just like it and if you enjoy you know listening to my videos I really appreciate your comments as well. They've been fantastic and really embracing. And I I truly love doing the Stitch With Me's when I get a chance to sit down and do them. So, yeah, I think I'm going to have to stop here now and uh, have a little break. And I will be back again soon with another one of my uh, projects to come back and talk to you. So I do hope you have a wonderful week now. And I hope wherever you are, the sun will be shining as it is in Scotland at the moment. So... Take care, my friends. Look after yourselves. Be well, and I'll see you soon.